Welcome back, everyone, to the Flow Track Podcast. Happy Pen Relays Week. I am Kevin Sully. He is Gordon Mack. And if you're watching live on YouTube or recorded on YouTube, you can see Gordon and I are both wearing gray shirts today to match the weather in Austin, Texas. Very rainy, very dreary. Power got knocked out of my house. I had to drive in to this makeshift studio here, Gordon, but uh, only three minutes late. I'm proud of myself after missing Friday's show. Uh, hopefully, your morning was less eventful. Well, I thought we're both wearing gray in honor of a Spur great's birthday, Tim Duncan. Today's mm. his birthday. So we're wearing Spurs colors. Put up your number 21 if you have it on, on today's uh, pod. Hey, thanks for filling in on Friday, by the way. Rough you, morning for me, to say the least. I don't know if you, I didn't listen to it yet. Did you go into why I wasn't there? Yeah, you told me you had the food poisoning, and I kind of told you that it was weird that you were getting a burger with your neighbor. And that's probably what caused the food poisoning. And next time you should listen to me about not having burgers with your neighbors on random Thursday afternoons. So I consulted my neighbor. I said, hey, did you have any stomach issues? He said, no. So that wasn't it. I asked my family, did you have any stomach issues? No. So I have no idea. All I know is I was up 30 minutes before the pod started. I thought it was all gone. I'm not going to go into specifics. It came <laughs> back. So I texted you. I said, I can't, I can't do it. I can't, not going to happen. I uh, went back to bed, was totally disoriented, woke up though at 9.26. So this would have been 20 minutes into the pod. And that's when I had another, let's just say, serious event. So if I did join you for the pod, you would have seen a lot of like this throughout. I would not have been able to make it. It would have been a, a big time DNF for me. So thank you for filling in uh, on, on Friday. We got a lot to get to. We got a guest coming up in 25 minutes or so. Yep, uh, we're gonna have Oliver Hoare of On Athletics Club who will be competing at the Penn Relays. Again, this is Penn Relays Week, we're really excited. Uh, they're going for that world best in the four by mile. Uh, saw the Oregon boys try to do that earlier this uh, weekend or this past weekend. So we'll talk a little about that with him, his thoughts on Oregon not racing them and you know what he's expecting to get out of this, this fun event um, at Penn Relays on Friday night. But we'll get into that later. He's joined the pod in about 25 minutes live. Uh, but we have a lot to talk about this weekend because basically I kind of previewed the weekend as like nothing's happening because I didn't think yeah, anything was going to happen. I was like, this is kind of a dud weekend. Everyone's mm -hmm. just waiting for Penn Relays weekend. But I was wrong. A lot of people <laughs> ran and they ran all over the country. Let's do this lightning round style. We're in about, what, three minutes or so on each? Are these topics until Oliver comes? Is that the plan? All right. So we don't have a clock to hold us accountable. Well, let's start first with Caitlin Tui, who runs a personal best out at the Virginia Challenge, 15-14 to win by almost 12 seconds in this race. Puts her atop the national list. Now, Gordon, remember we saw indoors. Tui had a spectacular meet, second in the 3,000, second in the 5,000 coming into NC State, she obviously had tons of expectations. But since she's been in college, she's never been the NCAA favorite. She's never been the NCAA favorite. And for good reason. There's been other more qualified people in front of her, which contrasted strongly with high school, where virtually her entire career, every race, she was the favorite. It was more a question of how fast is she going to run than if she's going to win, right? What record is she going to break? Can she beat her PR? But now I think for the first time, so at the end of April here, I think it's fair to say that she is the favorite for the 5,000 at NCAAs. When you look at who's already run this year, when you look at people who are going to be running other events, and just how impressive this run was coming off of what she did in indoors, I think she's earned that distinction as, as the NCAA favorite in the five. So... Obviously, she got, she got second on the indoor 5K, and Courtney Wayman won't be in it because Courtney Wayman will be doing the steeple. But she did get second to Taylor Rowe, and Taylor Rowe, a week earlier, ran 15-21, which is, you know, not 15-14, but she also destroyed her field by, a, like, 10-plus seconds. So Taylor yeah. Rowe did put together a similar impressive 5K effort, in my opinion, but... The momentum that Caitlin Tui has right now and, you know, the history and like the establishment of what she's done, 
she is going to be the the favorite that you're going to want to pick as the favorite. Because Taylor Rowe, I'm not trying to turn this into a Taylor Rowe podcast, but let's just remember, <laughs> she ran 15-21. She won the yeah. 3K. She was fifth at NCAA cross country. Fifth. Okay? Mm -hmm. Fifth. Uh, Caitlin Tui was, what was Tui? 15th. So mm -hmm. Taylor Rowe on paper has had better results leading into outdoor championships. Mm -hmm. But Caitlin Tui has something different. She has one, she's, she ran a good 1500. So she's showing some speed. She's showing, you know, she has obviously the pedigree of being kind of the star athlete. Like no one was really mm -hmm. talking about Taylor Rowe in high school or freshman year. So Caitlin Tui is basically in NBA terms. It's like picking Kevin Durant over a Devin Booker, you know, like Devin Booker may be playing better right now and his team might be better right now, but you got to like the, the sexy pick of a Kevin Durant. And so I, I, agree. I think she's a co-favorite. I don't think she's the favorite. I think she's a co-favorite <laughs> with Taylor Rowe. Mercy Chalangut's not in the mix anymore. I'm not going with that. None of the other women. I think it's a co-favorite of 5K. And Tui, I would say, has a 40% chance of winning. Taylor Rowe has a 40% chance of winning. And then the rest of the field has a 20% chance. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Let's go to a pair of 19 point nine twos from the weekend first on the college side uh matthew bowling ran his out at georgia tech so he's now run win legal sub 10 in the 100 and sub 20 in the 200 since we're talking favorite status where do you put bowling after this run i think bowling moves back up into favorite status of the 200 uh javante harding kind of had that crown coming off of indoors because he won the indoor 200 meter title joseph fambula then kind of took over that favorite status after a great florida relay 200 mm -hmm. but joseph fambula does not have that great of a start and while start is less important in a 200 than a 100 1992 bowling's got something to run for fambula is, he's fun at the freaking olympics i just <laughs> I think he'll be think, motivated for NCAAs, though. I, I don't think once a person for... runs in the Olympics, they just bag it for the NCAA season. I don't think they rest on their laurels. I'm still going with Fonbele. I still have yeah. the head-to-head -head matchup in my head. I still think the rest of the field hears footsteps when he comes. It's almost like he's turned the bad start into an asset because people know that he's coming. SECs is going to tell us a whole bunch. This is a great run run for bowling. And you, when you look at where he sits in the U.S. side of things, it's obviously very promising, right, how he's going to compete at U.S. champs this year. But I still have Fambule number one. But it's got to feel good for bowling to have some, some wind legal PBs getting under those big barriers. Yeah, wind legal and headwind legal. That was into a headwind. That was into negative 0.9. So yeah. it wasn't like a 1.8, 1 1.9. That was a negative headwind. So um, – mm -hmm. Yeah, I think bowling also, I think, I think he is just building up all that rage from his indoor championship performances, and he's just going to let it all out in Eugene, and I think it's going to be something special. So I'm willing to say bowling is a favorite. I think Fambula is the second favorite, and I don't think it's equal. I think it's, you know, 49-51, mm. you know, 51%, 49%. Nobody else has a chance. Nobody else show up to Eugene. Correct. <laughs> Running off rage. I like that. All right. The other 1992, Christian Coleman ran a 200. You should be very happy about that, Gordon, after last week critiquing Gordon or critiquing Coleman for not running the two, just running the four by one. Uh, 1992, I don't know uh, if you could take a ton from this. Obviously, he's more of a 100 guy. The margin of victory was pretty big when you look at it, but he's running against collegiates. He wasn't running against Curly or Norman, but. Sign of health, sub-20 is solid. I don't know what else we can read into this other than we're all just waiting for that pre-classic matchup at this point. I feel like that's going to be the big tell before USA's, and then obviously there'll be some other Diamond Leagues along the way. But all this stuff just feels like a preamble to pre. I mean, the thing I take away from it is 
he needed six more days to run a 200. Why didn't he run it at Mount Sac? He was in the start <laughs> list. Why does he fly across the country to do a four by one? Oh, we're doing the flying. We're doing and the fly back again. across the country to run this 200. Like, if he was planning on running a 200 within six days, why do you go all the way to Mount Sac and back before running his 200? That's why I take away from it. I, I think it's, you know. Gordon actually works for the airline industry, guys. You should know this. And he's really concerned about people racking up miles that is going to cost his company money. Just, That's the issue here. I mean, Coleman in the 200 is still, I'm not sure if I'm. Sold, especially with the men's U.S. 200 field right now. I mean, wait till Noah Lyles is throwing down 200s. Wait till Kenny B's doing it. Wait till Knighton's doing it. It's just there's a lot of great 200 meter runners. Yeah. Um, see what bowling. It's doing practice now. for the hundred. It's, it's practice, practice for the hundred. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's not 1992 is a good. I mean, I think his hundred's going to get. I think. I'm excited. Like I agree with you. I'm excited to see what he does at pre. We talked about that pre field is great, and mm-hmm. it's going to really push all of the top sprinters in the world to their best. And yeah, so I guess I give him a an A minus for this race. I mean, if he would have ran like nineteen eight low, I would have been a little more like whoa. But you know, nineteen ninety two. Mm-hmm. I mean, college kids are still. It's kind of interesting though when you see the 1992, and a college kid just did it, so it's kind of hard to like freak out about it. So, yeah, but still, yeah. 19 signifies you're in shape. You don't accidentally run 19. Yeah, you're, you you're ready to roll, and you're ready to run something sure. quick. I think in the hundred. And remember, early on, we forget this because it wasn't an issue when he won in Doha, but it was always that back half of Coleman's hundred, and you're just thinking, man, if he can just hold that back half together, he's going to be great. And then Lyles had the opposite issue where it was the beginning part of it and i think more 200s just further cement coleman as as you know being able to put together a whole 100 meter race now is it going to be enough for against lamont marshall jacobs and curly and degrasse etc we'll see all right let's stay on the 200 my favorite genre of the 200 this year the women's 200 particularly the collegiate women's 200 particularly the sec women's 200 we had some good news there if you're following that event uh, Favor Ophelia, the collegiate record holder, runs 10-9, win dated in 100. And then Abby Steiner ran a 200, got a win legal, personal best, 22.05. Gordon, it just keeps getting better and better and better for the women's 200 this year. Yeah. You know, it's kind of wild, though. When I saw the 22.05 result, I kind of thought it would be faster. She's She's been having such a great... Indoor season and that crazy headwind 200 that you're thinking, oh, eventually the, you know, the elastic band is going to be let go and she's going to throw down like a 21.8 or 21.7. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen that yet, but again, it is only April. And I do think we will see that at SECs because you talk about LSU's favorite Ophelia. She runs her 21.9. Mm-hmm. They're going to race each other. They're, they're going to race each other multiple times. Once at SECs, again, at the East prelims. So yep. they're going to be able to push each other. And I think we're going to see something special because when you have now the presence of affiliate of LSU, we know what Steiner's doing right now. It's just mm-hmm. we're building up to like a big bang. That's what we're building up to. <laughs> but here's the thing. We're building up to a big bang. No, actually we're not. We're building up to a medium bang. No, we're building up to a small bang. The small bang is as NCA. No, we're building up to a half of a small no. bang, which is SECs. Then a mm-hmm. smaller, a bigger small bang at NCAAs. Then a medium bang at USA's mm-hmm. when Gabby Thomas is involved. And then a hurricane of a big bang at Worlds <laughs> when the Jamaicans are involved. And well, Christine okay. Boma. It's like going to get increasingly yeah. crazier. Yeah, but I think it is tough to expect the collegians to still be at the same place now as they will be at USS. Maybe they will, but you're right. Maybe it will just get better and better and better, and we'll have a freaking full-on mosh pit by the time we get to the world championships. However, the, it could happen at SECs. And when I say it could happen, I mean when we see 21-7, 21-8 in the same race. Or just seeing these two women together in the same race. Because right now, you, this is the all-time list. You got Ophelia, 2196, Kyra Jefferson, 2202, Don Sol, 2204, and Steiner, 2205. She was, ba- she was four one-hundredths away from moving to number two all-time. 
and then we'd have the best two in history, fastest two in history in the event at the same time in the same conference. I mean, how often has that happened uh, in sprinting? Like that's, yeah. that's a pretty cool thing to track. So we don't know though when that crazy moment is gonna happen. I just think it will at some point because you put that much talent on the track at the same time, something cool is gonna happen. Um, all right, let's stay with the sprints. Brittany Brown, uh, 10.66, wind aided in the 100, beats Gabby Thomas, 10.80. Uh, I have a whole thing on wind right now that I'm going to do, but I'm going to save it for this week in track. I'm really disappointed in the wind this year. It's just been, like, confusing all of us, and I don't like it. I want the wind to stop at these track meets or at least stay at <laughs> 2.0. I don't know what to do with all these times. You got 10.6, 10, 10.7, 10, like, plus 3.2, plus 4.1, plus 2.5. I don't like it. Here's what I know. Brittany Brown won the bronze medal. In the in the 200 in Doha, Brittany Brown in this race, you can use the converters and you know whatever 10.8. But finishing ahead to Gabby Thomas is a good result because we've seen how good Gabby Thomas has been in the one and the two this year. And if you think about Brown going under, she went under 11 for the first time this year. But that's a huge jump up for her. So whether or not she's going to do the 100, whether or not she's going to do the 200, this is all good news. You know, put the even you put the time aside. This is good news to get in that field and win that race. I would say, I, I, already, I think I already mentioned this about Brittany Brown, but this performance is like night and day better than her bronze performance at Worlds in the 200 because that World 200 in, was it Doha? It was not yeah. a good field. Like it was a Everybody was field. scratching. Everyone was out. Lots so of scratches, yeah. This is probably, and I would say, this is her best. I mean, look at this. Look at this uh, descending order list now. All time, it's seventh mm -hmm. when you can include uh, wind aided marks. You know, that's kind of yeah. crazy. Now, 3.2 is the most wind of those of that group. But like when Tori Bowie was on top of the world in 2015, she was running 10 7 with 3.2 wind. So mm -hmm. uh, it definitely is setting up for her to be a legit player at the world level in this 100. And with Shakari Richardson, Kind of being nowhere to be seen right now it you have to think maybe this is britney brown's time to take over this hundred and maybe just maybe be a fighting chance against the big three of jamaica because right now the u.s mm -hmm. women do not have any any bullets in the chamber to go up against the jamaican big three and maybe britney yeah. brown is the wild card that is coming in late in the game to kind of potentially break those three Jamaicans up. But if you look at the all conditions US 100 descending order list this year for the US, I made a mention of the fact that the wind is all over the place, but they got a lot of options. And I know it's going to be tough to finish ahead of Thompson, Hurrah, and Fraser Price, but look at all the candidates because you also had Cambria Sturgis this weekend run legal 10 8, right? And we saw what she did at NCAAs last year. You had Aaliyah Hobbs this weekend run a windy 10 84. Like, if you look at just this year, and if you look at the women's 100 list, we feel really good, obviously, about Tiana Daniels, because what does she do, Gordon? She makes teams. Right. The other two, I don't know. There's a lot of question marks, but there's a lot of talent there. There's a lot of ability in both the 100 and the 200 to have somebody break through. Yeah, let's, let's blow this up so I can see it. Uh, Brown, 1066. Richardson. Oh, wait, this is last. Wait, was this last year? What are we looking at? Well, this is past two years. It's past, past two years. years. Sorry, sorry. So Brown, Richardson, Sturgis, that's a legal 1074. Terry, 1077. Windy this year. Hobbs, 1080. Thomas, 1080. Tamara Clark, we didn't even mention her, 1081. Solera Barnes, 1082. Windy. I mean, it just goes on and on and on with the amount of people who have run fast. Now, a lot of those are windy. So you take those out, you take them with a grain of salt. But... I think somebody is going to emerge by the time we get to USA's. It's going to take something quick to win that race. I think the gap uh, might have shrunk a bit between last year and this year. Because I think it had yeah. to. It was pretty big last year. Uh, it, it could not have gotten any bigger because there's a limit to how fast Thompson Raw and Fraser Price are going to run, I would assume. I could be wrong this year. Maybe they go 10-4. But there was a pretty wide gap. U.S. was not a factor in the 100 last year. The 200, they were. The 100, they weren't. And I think that's going to shrink again this year. Yo-yoed back and forth. Well, the thing I think about 
Okay, and this isn't to disrespect Brittany Brown, because again, she's running. But if Elaine Thompson Hurrah was in that exact race, what is she running in Waco, Texas right now? Mm -hmm. If in a race where Brittany Brown is running 1066 with 3.2 wind, what would Elaine Thompson Hurrah have run in that race? Well, but I don't know, because you say you could have said the same thing about, well, what could Gabby Thomas have run if she was in that race? Because we would have had Thomas ahead of Brown just based on last year. Well, but Thomas, no, Gabby Thomas so is a know. 200. Gabby Thomas is a 200. So uh, Hunter was think... pretty good last year. Look, yeah, Hunter was pretty I, good last year. Not as good I just as a two, know, like, was pretty the, good. Would, I'm trying to get, would Elaine Thompson Har run like 10 5 in that race? Probably. Yeah, that's fair. Was she afforded with 10 4? That's fair. I don't know. Got to go to Waco to find out. Got to go to Waco to find out. Let's keep let's keep rolling. I want to switch this. Can we do four by mile right before we bring Oliver Hor on? That way we can roll into that naturally. That'd be a smoother transition. Let's talk about Felix, twenty two four, Gordon, and her farewell tour. This is pretty fast. This is pretty fast. You look at how this matches up to her other season debuts. Uh, this is pretty good. She ran in South Carolina, and she just adds. Jefferson of Coastal Carolina, who just was the NCAA 60 meter champion. Felix said after Mount Sac, she was going to run about four races this year. Didn't mention which race would be her last. I don't know if she's going to run USA's, but she's in legit shape. She's in legit shape right now to be able to run that quick. Yeah. She said time doesn't matter. She's not running about time. But clearly, she's in shape, like you said. <laughs> she's going to be so hard to predict. Like, she's going to be the hardest athlete to have a, a mm -hmm. beat on of how she's going to perform at USA's because she isn't telling us what her... We don't even know if she's running USA's. We don't, we don't know. know. We don't, she doesn't know what her goal are. Like, yeah. is her goal to at least make the 4x4? Four because four? that would be like a fun swan song is, you know, finish top eight, at USA's and then you're on the four by four yeah. and then you can, you know, carry that yeah. torch all the way to the worlds. But it just seems very uh unknown to see what she um is thinking. Yeah. I yeah. wish I get if it, I ever if we're at a whatever meet she's at, they need to ask her like, all right, are you trying to Yeah, is she oh she's at Pen Relays. Okay, we, I'm gonna ask her. I'll be like, <laughs> are you Trying to if run only the only there was somebody in the media who could ask gonna, her this oh, question at a meet. I am on Allison Felix information you, challenge. You writing it down? That's all I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not commentating hope. any races. I'm not interviewing anybody. I'm just going to find Allison Felix, and I'm going to ask her. One, I'm going to. Hey, I'm. A, I apologize for doubting you in 2021, but you know you got an Olympic medal out of it, so we're all cool now. Number two, what are you doing? What are you actually trying to run? I need to know. The people. By the know. way, how cool was that? Like Melissa Jefferson getting a run with Felix in one of her last yeah. races. How awesome is that? Growing up, idolizing Allison Felix and having that moment. That's pretty awesome. If you were um, Melissa Jefferson a year ago, you're going to be the 60 meter champ and you're going to get to run against Allison Felix in one of her final five races of her career. She'd yeah. be like, what? Really? That'd be awesome. <laughs> I was looking at results LSU meet here. Apparently, Michael Cherry, this result popped out, split 43-8 on the open. And then I pulled up the results, but then I was a bit confused because the Athletics Canada team that got third, it's listed as a 43-1 opening split. So I don't know what to believe anymore. Um, do I do know, know that I, this my, meet. Do you know what if do you it's think? possible? It's possible maybe the split timers did it right on the – because it could, put, could have been a three-turn stagger, and they didn't account for the three-turn stagger. Well, yeah, it's got to be a three-turn stagger, but okay. But maybe okay. they did the split, you know. They just listed it in the World Athletics rundown, Cherry split, so I didn't know if they knew something that we didn't know. This, this meet, though, did produce the best tweet of, of the weekend, because it was Vernon Norwood at this meet. He was. And he got a picture with none other than? Mr. Tony McQuay. Tony McQuay, uh, tagged flow track. He did the Spider Man meme. Which one of us is Tony McQuay? What'd you think of this? I think you've started something here, Gordon. 
Vernon Nor with an O, not an A. Uh, Colt. Vernon with an O. Um, Colt is furiously trying to pull up the tweet. It's good. No, good, good producing by Colt here. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, or, uh, boy, it's not able to find it. We need to help out. Where's our? I guess uh, Travis is is gone. Um, our producer isn't. But basically, here. Gosh, I, I need to find the tweet for. I can't find the tweet, guys. I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, all right. I'm sorry. Colt but, cannot um, find the tweet. Colt's got to focus on the guests coming up too. This is we're asking a lot of Colt this week, and next week. Here's a tweet. Uh, we're pausing. For... There you go. Travis just sent it to us. He's listening. Travis is always listening. <laughs> Travis is there. I thought it was a great tweet. Yes. Which so, one, which as one you is know, the real Tony McQuay? I have been saying the men's US 400. There's two types of runners there's a LaShawn Merritt's and there's the Tony McQuay's. Both are great, but one wins medals individually, the other one wins medals on relays. And mm-hmm. I said that Vernon Norwood was a Tony McQuay because Vernon Norwood is really good at making relay teams. And uh, now Vernon has seen himself Spider-Man meme style. So it's pretty <laughs> a good run for him too. By the way. Yeah. Norwood, good opener. Uh, really good one. And Cherry continuing his 44 second streak. Yeah. That, so. that 400 was good. You had uh, Gardner 44-2, Norwood 44-59. Three guys under 45 with Matthew Hudson Smith. Um, all right, let's jump back. Let's talk about this uh, Oregon four by mile attempt. They came up short. Came up short, Gordon. I thought they were going to get it. You said yes, but then switched to no. You did a, a, a terrific U turn in the pickup contest. I got at least the fastest split right. Cole Hawker closed in three, or sorry, Cooper Tier closed in 353. Um, he ran really well. Matt Wisner ran really well. Uh, the issue was you only got 357 out of Hawker. And then James West, was James West over four minutes? Do I have that right for his split? I believe so. Yeah, so you had, I'm going to pull him up right now. You had Wisner 359, West 401, Hawker 357, and Tier 353. So they missed it by three seconds. I mean, West is a 334 guy, so I don't think they were penciling in a 401 for him. And then Hawker, I thought he might be better suited to run when there's competition in this, but there's no way it's it's tough to manufacture competition in a in a race like this. So they come up a bit short despite tiers three fifty three. Yeah. And it just shows how hard it is to run a mile by yourself, you know? With lights. Like, Sometimes just said lights. the lights were off too. Yeah. Well, I'm not like even thinking pacing. about the lights. Like it's just like you have no one to head. Yeah. It's just like all mental. It's just you and your time. I mean, I'm very impressed that you know Cooper Tier was able to run what he ran by himself. Yeah. You know, like that's man Cooper Tier, bro. He is 353 <laughs> solo. Like it is pretty. It's like it's interesting. Tier is 350 when there's the perfect amount of competition and then 353 solo. Like we know both ends of the spectrum with Cooper Tier. Because I, I mentioned, I mean, you you discount the lights and I know it's not as big of a deal as some people make it out to be, but like the pace was all off and in his anchor, like they actually turned them off. So there was really nothing else out there. And I think he said he, he knew that he needed 53 for the last 400, but 53 after going out that hard with nobody around you, that's a really tall order to to try to get that mark. So Ireland, anchored by Ray Flynn, lives to see another day. Or will they? Because we have another one coming up uh, at Penn Relays at Friday. But yeah, one more thing on Cooper. We saw what Grant Fisher has been doing, um, obviously with his 10K record. Paul Chalimo is kind of hiding out in Kenya. We see him working out on his Strava and his Instagram. I'm mm-hmm. assuming Paul Chalimo is fit. And Paul Chalimo is one of the great 5K runners. Yeah, yeah. Where would you rank Cooper Tier right now in the 5K against Paul Chalimo and Grant Fisher? Is he first, second, or third? Keep him. You keeping him third? Jeez. It's hard. Well, what is lane he... is Chalimo going to finish in? Can you tell me what lane Chalimo is going to run into? Uh, that's to be determined. Depends on. Yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah, I just don't. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we we, don't, we haven't seen enough from from Chalimo, and then even Fisher has just been you know those sort of time trial setups. So I mean, I think it's close. We got our guest. Our guest is here. It is Oliver Hoare of the On Athletics Club. He'll be running in the four by mile at Penn. He's also a co-host of the Coffee Club podcast. Fellow podcaster, Oliver, thanks for coming on. How you doing, man? Can you hear us? Don't know if Oliver can hear us. us. Man, that great intro. All right, great (laughs) intro, and we could not stick the landing. Uh, That's okay. I could. Oliver, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys now. Yeah, I was. I was I I could. I couldn't hear you guys, and then you looked at me like I was like, "Oh no." I think that's that's on me. that's on me. I'm yeah. sorry, Oliver. That's on me. <laughs> See, so we good. have a producer. We have a producer, Oliver. I don't. I assume you guys don't have a producer for your podcast. Um, but it just goes to show you sometimes less is more. Yeah, very true. Yeah, and technology can kind of get in the way as well. Usually not helpful so, sometimes. So before you, uh, so before, before you hopped on, we were recapping the attempt by. Here, Hawker and company at Hayward in that four by mile mark. Uh, what what'd you think of the race? Yeah, uh, it was interesting because I I think Matt ran really well through fifty nine. That was pretty awesome for him. Um, I mean, Tears ankle was pretty crazy three fifty three. Doing that um, by yourself is no no easy task. Uh, it, it definitely watching that made me realize how miserable it would be to do it by yourself. Um, <laughs> And I think they did a great job. It was obviously great fan engagement there as well. So uh, it looked like it was a good time. I think they had fun with it. And uh, that's at the end of the day, if you're going to go for something like that, you want to enjoy it. And I think they did that. So it was it was pretty exciting. I think um, it was interesting to see Hawker not. I I think Hawker's three fifty seven is obviously not um, a testament to where what type of athlete he is and probably where he is. I think uh, he could obviously run quicker than that, but. At the end of the day, um, they went and had a crack at it, and they, I think, second all time, which is pretty, pretty impressive feat. So, um, and it, and that's that's pretty awesome. So, congrats to them. There is kind of an advantage to being able to see them try to go for the record a week before, because you see what Hawker did runs three fifty seven. He clearly is not a three fifty seven miler. But that's what his best was on that day. Do you see that and kind of take note from that and be like, hey, a three you know, 34, 15, 333, 1500 meter runner ran 357 in a mile. How do you, is there any going to be conversation between you and your teammates of how for you guys to be better than a 357 solo, seeing how Cole Hawker who's making Olympic finals running 357 miles, like, cause that could easily, you guys have equal ability to him, if not even better, but he was only able to pull off a 357. So how do you kind of learn from what it's like running a mile by yourself late in a, in a relay yeah uh the the one thing i think we took away from it was that it's not easy um even a guy of his caliber it it can it can be a hard struggle sometimes so it's about being mentally focused and switched on and making sure that you're ready for that kind of pain that kind of different um suffering in a mile where you're not really having anyone to gauge off i know particularly for me and and uh and joe um we've been athletes that can kind of push that all the time in in the race, whether it's a mile, like we can kind of go gauge off ourselves and go for it. Whereas someone like George, who is a great tactical racer and also can run really, really fast in the right conditions and race, he's probably going to um, struggle with it more than what we would because he hasn't really experienced it as much as what we have. So for him, that would be a good learning curve. And obviously it's good to see, like you said, it's, it's an advantage for us to see those guys go for it and see how the challenges that face those really talented athletes, um, we can kind of take note from that and then address it uh, when we go for it. You, I was listening to your podcast, your reaction to finding out about this attempt. <laughs> You're very colorful, colorful with your language. I, I enjoyed it. Um, for those who didn't see the podcast, uh, you mentioned how a lot of people on the internet were kind of like, what are you guys doing here? Why is Oregon doing a four by mile? A week before we are clearly they could have come to Penn. What what's going on? And they act like no one wanted to challenge them when there was already a four by mile set up months and months in advance. Um, have you talked to these guys at all about it? And uh, I guess have you had any time to re reflect now that you saw them do their fifteen fifty two? What's your kind of final take on the fact that 
or having two four by miles within a six day span? Yeah, um, I, I still think it's hashtag not good for the sport at all. Um, I mean, I think what I saw there was fantastic, but it's nothing that's new. It's what I expected. I expected to see great fan engagement. I expect to see people come out and see two of the best um, American middle distance runners. Um, I, I, I expected that. Um, and I think that one thing that we addressed on our podcast in, cl- in colorful language was that, uh, you know, we, we want to make the sport better. We already, I already see the sport at that level. I already see great fan engagement. I already see these two individuals doing great things. And again, we addressed that it's not like completely on the athletes like Cooper and Cole, um, in particular, they're going to do what they think is best, but also they're going to be told as well by um, sponsors and by coaches to do this kind of structure. Um, and we're all victims of that as athletes. And I think the one thing that we were addressing was it would be great to be able to kind of break that mold and compete in maybe an event that's not got a Nike tick in front of it. Um, and you're not a Nike athlete. Um, there are some events like that, like um, New Balance uh, meets pre. There's a lot of athletes that are from different different companies that go out and compete. And I think that was the one thing that we were kind of trying to address was that there's a bit of a structure. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I, we spoke to Matt. Matt was Matt Wines was out with us um, in Boulder. He was working with us with New Gen, doing some cool things um, that are coming out for Penn. And uh, yeah, I mean, for them, it was kind of, it wasn't supposed to be as big as I think it was. Um, they were just going to kind of go for it. You know, they'll, they'll get the training in, they'll staying in, uh, in Eugene to just get, to get good training and be a part of the meet, um, and contribute to get the vibe up, get the, get the hype in for athletes to, and, um, non-athletes to come in and, and enjoy what was going on. So for them, yeah, it was definitely, I think when Oregon posted that tweet, that was where I kind of got really angry because the tweet itself kind of said that, Oh, no one, no one came up to us and said, um yeah like um, you know we, we invite all these people uh high school teams college teams pro teams no one responded another shushy face and i thought that's kind of that, that kind of sucks because i know for a fact that we invited everyone and and rightly so people obviously have better plans than to do relays at this time of year it's it's not a great year for technically pro athletes to go into relays there's 10k um us trials coming up there's all these other diamond leagues coming up and bigger races and people want to run prs i understand that a relay might not be in your best intentions as a team, but we did send an invite out before. So, and they also sent us an invite month a month uh, before the meet too. And we kind of set, like already portrayed ourselves as going to Penn. So um, that tweet itself got me annoyed because I know that's not the athletes. That's the system itself. Just trying to obviously take away from something else like Penn or take away something else like Drake. Um, because again, like Penn and Drake are, been around for so long and they're competing relay um, events. Um, and yeah, it's just, it was kind of annoying seeing that. And I know that's not the athletes at all. And even the coach, I don't think they were involved in that. That was just discommunication. Um, and yeah, that fires you up <laughs> because you want to be able to compete against these guys. Like I, if uh, those Oregon boys uh, came to Penn and they kicked our asses, I think it would have been a great, um, great experience for not just us to learn from, getting beaten, but also for the crowd and the spectators, the Cole Hocker and Cooper Tier fans. So that was kind of what we wanted to get behind and, and push. Um, but again, you know, it's it's definitely something that it's just the way the system is and the system isn't hasn't changed. It's going to be, you know, like Arkansas have their own relay system. Oregon now have Oregon relays. You have Drake, you have Penn. There's all these different um, relay systems going on because people are trying to create their own um, – monopoly over it and it's just not a great thing where i mean i guess an example would be in a different sport i know somebody kind of reached out saying it wasn't bad for the sport because um you know they're creating all this hype and in this environment in their own kind of home system but like if you look at f1 uh last weekend was in italy that's ferrari's home home course home system uh red bull didn't shy away and say oh we'll just we'll just stay in the netherlands and do our grand prix we'll go to uh italy and, and beat the ferrari team and that's what they did so I feel like there's not that the, the rivalry that's not as focused. It's more focused on just the athletes making sure that they're protected um, in the system by not just getting beaten by, by their own kind of branding. So, um, but that's the way I've kind of felt about it. And 
yeah, it kind of sucks. I don't, we don't get to race them because I think now it's just, it's another time trial coming up next week that people are just going to expect us to run around and do the exact same thing. Um, so it was a, yeah, it's a bit disheartening, but at the end of the day, hopefully like there's a message out there and, and maybe next time if maybe if we don't do pen, we go to Oregon relays and we try and chase, chase the competition. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so you said, relays- you said it was a month out. You got an email from them a month out inviting you. I mean, what uh, was Dath- your response? Yeah. D- Dathan did it. He's like, what are, are you guys like, what are you doing? We, we announced that we're doing pen three months ago and you, and now you're inviting us to a different relay system. Like, and, and on a sponsoring pen. So that's a, that's a reason why we're going. I mean, we're, we're a small brand and we're trying to impact on high school kids on, on, um, the American running community because we're not as big as Nike and, uh, it's an important meet for us. So it was a bit of a slap in the face, I think, to, to get that response and think, well, you guys are doing relay anyway. You could just come and do a relay. You can come do a workout, you know, come and, mm-hmm. and uh, come to Penn. Be, you know, you, if you get better than us, come beat us at our own um, sponsored meet. That'd be great advertisement for Nike, for the Oregon boys. So <clears throat> that's the way we kind of took it. And at the end of the day, you know, they've, they've got their own priorities and own motives to do what they do. And I'm not, I'm not, um, definitely not upset with the athletes or anything like that. Cause I think they're fantastic, um, lads and they are doing a great thing for the sport, particularly for American high school running and for, and for Oregon, um, itself. And Hey, we're just hyping it up for Eugene for worlds. But at the end of the day, like, I think people are going to get bored of the same kind of system when there's no change of, of rivalry. Um, when you want to compete against another team that's probably equally equally matched, there's a bit of a challenge there. And it creates a lot of um, learning curves and experiences when you compete against guys like that. You take so much away from it, whether you win or lose. So um, that's the way we took it. And at the end of the day, yeah, they make their decisions, we do ours. And hopefully um, in the future, we could see some, some rivalry and relays because I think the one thing that gets me annoyed uh, looking at major championships like Worlds or Olympics, they have these mixed um four by 400 four by 100 relays why don't put a dmr in there it's very exciting Mm -hmm. a lot of great countries with great dmr stuff and and that i feel like those rivalries and those meets like penn and drake and oregon and arkansas relays is that those hopefully meets bring attention to the sport that there is something missing in those major championships those relays those distance relays that those athletes miss out on so but yeah we'll we'll see what happens in the future i feel like everybody agrees on world championships Everybody obviously agrees on the Olympics. I want everybody to disagree on one more time. Just like, what can we agree on one more date in the year? I don't have any pie in the sky fantasies that we're going to be able to create this season where you and Cole and Cooper are going to be racing seven times. But could we at least just agree on like one more week on the calendar that's important? And maybe it is a four by mile because, as you mentioned, the groups are pretty evenly balanced now. Like, we have a lot of good groups throughout, especially US based groups. Um, that could bring a good team. And what would the incentive be? I don't know if it's money or maybe it's just the specter of show up, show up if you're legit. And if not, everybody's going to be asking questions because I feel like that's kind of what happened here. The pushback was all online, right? And it was not a matter Mm. of, it it, it was like people don't want to get mocked in the internet age. And obviously there's a fine line there. You don't want to go too far. But I feel like that is, is sort of driving some of this, this idea of like, hey, are you ducking this group or that group? I mean, do you see a, a future where we could at least just agree on one other weekend of the year where you guys would all race? Oh, yeah, 100%. I, yeah, the, the internet stuff is, is, I think that's all, it can all be garbage sometimes. Um, and, but it, at the end of the day, like I know, particularly like these athletes are getting ready for more important races. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think there's going to be one uh, one day, one meet that I don't know how we're going to build it up, but you have, you have Brooks Beast, you have the, um, Ben Thompson's, uh, Thomas's, um, group, you have Bauman, you have all these amazing athletes, men and women that could do these amazing meets. And I think the great thing about that too, particularly for fan engagement is that you have people that are OAC fans. You have people that are, that are, um, you know, the, the Nike team fans, you have people that are Brooks fans, Adidas fans. Like if you had one of those athletes, that's one of your favorites, but then you have four of them turn up to a meet and they're all there. Um, you don't usually get that kind of engagement. You don't usually get all those athletes at the same time in the same meet mm-hmm. because 
usually they're competing in different events. You know, Joe Quick was doing a 10K. I'm not doing a 10K. I'm not doing a 10K. Um, you know, 1500, like there's all these different people doing different events, different meets, not necessarily ducking, but they're, they're doing meets that's prioritizing to their schedule. But if there was able to be a day, which all these athletes were turning up together, I'd be like turning up to a running expo. Everyone's there. Um, you get to see Josh Kerr. You get to see Coop Petit. You get to see Matt Sensowitz. You get to see uh, George Beamish. Like there's all, like, it'd be incredible. And I think the one thing that needs to, be addressed with that is it's not the athletes all the coaches in some instances that are that are hindering this is probably the brands and the sponsors because they don't want to see athletes go and support another brand brand sponsored meet like they don't want to send support to that but if there was a way in which we made something whether it's a, a diamond league or an, an IAAF kind of section meet where it's kind of not encompassing one brand it's encompassing just um mm -hmm. Yeah, just the racing in general. Not not a world championships, but like a, a club team something, relay championships. I don't know, but it's definitely lacking in the sport because I think a, a meet like that you'd get a lot of fan engagement, and I think that's what people want is to be able to go to a meet where they have all these athletes that they know and love, um, all in the same place, all racing in the same race. It's uh, it would be something that would be very special, and I think if we were able to pull that off and everyone was able to turn up at least once, I think they'd come back because it'd be exciting whether you win or lose um, to be a part of something like that. I want to kind of segue into the, the race you're actually going to be running on Friday. Um, what's the order you're going to run? Are, can you tell us? And also, I noticed uh, Johannes Reyes is on here. Can you tell us a little bit about him? He's a, kind of a name I haven't heard of much. I'm sure you know, obviously, he's on your team. Uh, but what's the, the lineup you're planning on putting out there on the order? um yeah it'd be interesting uh ritz is ritz likes to go back and forth with the order a little bit <laughs> um <laughs> because i think i think you put joe clicker anyway he's gonna run probably you know a really good 355 354 uh mile maybe even quicker depending on how how good he feels um but i think for the order in particular uh we'll probably put um um we'll probably put yeah Giannis, for example is here he's training with us for uh six weeks in the year like he's part of our team now um from zurich and he's a great guy very swiss um he's awesome uh he's been great great to have him here he's been here for a few days and he's just getting back from an injury he has an ankle uh issue but he, he ran yesterday and he's he's doing well here in boulder so we're excited to have him um part of the team and uh, bring in some european vibes as well as carmela um it's been been fantastic to have him uh with the order at the moment um we're looking at um, getting Tom Elmer in to run a leg, who is a guy from the uh, Europe section of, of on. So he'll come in. Uh, Morgan has been running great. Um, Chicken Boy is moving stride to stride. Um, but he's definitely not in the position yet to run um, a quick mile yet. And I think we don't want to push him into that direction because we've seen so much um, positive um, growth, particularly in his running. So uh, we're going to probably have the order as, uh, I think, uh, Tom will probably go first, Jordy maybe second, and then Joe and I would go three four. Um, just because I think if there is some sort of gap that we need to gain from some time, I think Joe and I definitely have um, the uh, capability to kind of hurt ourselves <laughs> to try and push the time back and get as close as we can to the uh, to that record. Um, but as like as the Oregon guys showed, um, that record is very impressive, and it's done by four Irishmen, and one of them is my agent. So. I'd love to have bragging rights and uh, take it away from him. But uh, yeah, uh, that would be the order, but it can, it can honestly change. I know that I'll probably go last. Um, mm -hmm. I was toying the idea because we didn't have a fourth man at some point. I was telling Dathan, I'll just put me in the first and fourth leg. That would be entertaining. See if I can survive <laughs> um, two back-to-back -back miles after uh, doing, you know, because I felt, I felt I'm, in, I'm in very, very good shape right now. So the best shape I've been in um, this time of year uh, after – world indoors and uh, Australian champs. So it would have been funny to see people probably uh, see me go for the first leg and then come around for the fourth leg, uh, really uh, hurting myself. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that would be probably the order that we, <laughs> that we do. Uh, but we want to keep it exciting, obviously, as much as we can when it's kind of just us. Um, obviously, a lot of other teams have dropped out of it. But uh, yeah, we'll try and make it exciting as possible. If the clock says 12 minutes when you get the stick on anchor, do you believe that you could break the record? 
Um, yeah. If I got enough self hatred, yeah, yeah. If somebody whispered <laughs> Oregon or they had the O, they had the O plus <laughs> or something like that, then I would, I'd probably hurt myself. But um, yeah. I mean, I think I can. I mean, the one thing with those is you never know until you get to the day. Like, um, particularly with relays, I feel like there's so much that goes into it. There's so much. Um, like everyone obviously has to be on. Like somebody could have an off day and it could really set you back. I know James West, for example, is an incredible athlete and he ran four oh one, I think. Um, and he's obviously a better athlete than that. But you know, sometimes in the day you just don't perform or don't deliver um what you what you think you can. So but yeah, if I saw that on the clock and I saw someone holding an Oregon T shirt up, I probably would break it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we need to make sure we need, cast Oregon t -shirt. we need to get Oregon T shirts around the track and you just constantly are chasing the T shirts as Running pure hate to get to this fifteen forty nine. <laughs> um, Sounds good. How, is this new? The hatred for Oregon, or is that back from Wisconsin days? Oh, it's a bit of Wisconsin days, but it's it's not. It's okay. it's a bit. I just I. Uh, it's a bit more of a rivalry thing. I like to stir the pot a little bit. I just feel like sometimes it's a bit too uh, too bland with some things, and like I mean with with uh, with Josh as well. Like me and Josh stir each other up all the time. Um, but he's a Scotsman and I'm an, an Aussie. So like we're used to that kind of, uh, back and forth, uh, <laughs> giving each other crap. And, um, but obviously, you know, when, when people do well, like particularly when Josh is, is out lights out killing it, I always, you know, give him, give him good creds and he he's the same with me. So there's a great, we have a, like, there's a great relationship when it comes to rivalry like that. And I'd like to start that with Oregon. Um, because I know in particular, Cole and Cooper are going to be fantastic athletes for years to come. And I hope to be that too, as well as my teammates. And we'd love to, uh, to stir them up as much as possible, give them a bit of, you know, make, make their lives a little bit harder than what they are. And, uh, you know, sometimes that, push, that pushes greatness. And if you, if you can give them the stirring up and then they run ridiculous times, then sometimes I feel like, oh, I'm responsible for that in some way. And then hopefully they feel the same when they stir me up or give me a bit of slack. I hope, you know, I, I, I really enjoy uh, getting, <laughs> getting caught out or, or, or people giving me a bit of slack. It's, um, I feel like sometimes it's good for the ego and also good for the ambition. So, uh, yeah, the, um, and also I think with Oregon as well, they, they definitely have um, a reputation of being, you know, the track school. Um, mm -hmm. And I went to obviously Wisconsin where you've got, you know, Chris Solinsky and Simon Byron, Morgan McDonald and all these other athletes that have had a great legacy on, on Wisco. So we obviously feel like we have a great track legacy as well, as well as cross. So yeah, it's a bit, bit of both, I think. Getting would, back to the uh... point about, candor between you and you and josh i mean i've always obviously noticed that back to your collegiate days like you guys speak um freely i'll say the least and you guys um are not afraid to go back and forth or say what you think and then now you have this pod cast where you guys also aren't shy with your opinions you jordy and, and morgan i'm curious has anything that you've said on the pod gotten back to an athlete that you've spoken about and cause any sort of issue? Like, have you been getting texts on the side? Uh, have you been confronted in any races about what you said on the pod? Because as podcasters, you know, Gordon and I, sometimes you hear it in real life, but oftentimes people just kind of separate mm. what they see on a computer screen or what they hear in their, their headphones. Um, they don't expect to actually see you as, as a real person. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, we haven't really received anything. Um, we've actually, the, the great thing about podcasting as, as you guys also, also might experience is that we get educated quite a bit because sometimes we make mistakes and uh people fans and 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 all that they'd always message us and say hey this is what like happened like i think that was a great system with uh when i was in serbia for worlds like next to our hotel there was just a big um just pile of rubble and i didn't know what was going on i thought like it was just it was just like construction had stopped and there was just this pile of rubble next to it but we when we had, we said that on the pod, we got educated by a, a Serbian, um, a fan who told us that no, there was a bombing in 1999 and this is what occurred. And, and that sort of stuff for us is like great because we want to be able to like, um, get better and, and fine tune the craft of, of podcasting and being able to be as, as educated and as aware as possible of what we can portray and what we can talk about. And that's also been a great factor, but we've never really been approached by a guest or anything like that saying, you know, of what we've said or what we've, we've tried to say. I mean, I have this ongoing thing about, uh, mispronouncing people's names, um, <laughs> which I, I always think is quite funny, um, but I do it to my teammates as well. Um, but I haven't been approached about that yet. Um, with, with Josh in particular, like I think Josh and I, I mean, I was telling jo Josh he was getting soft because, you know, he's engaged and he's, he's got the Olympic bronze medal. Like, you know, what else do you want? Like, you're, 
you're kind of getting soft now. You got it. You ticked all the boxes. Um, you know, like we we stir each other up because he probably stirred me up about wearing on cleats or something like that. And yeah, I'm. I think with that, like it's just great back and forth, and we've never really. I don't think he or him and I don't know, maybe uh, Ribich would pay attention to our podcast a little bit, but I don't think they would pay attention to it much. I think they're pretty focused on their own agenda. And if something does come up, they look at it and probably give it a laugh and give us a counter. And it, it kind of goes back and forth, but I, I definitely enjoy that. Um, and, and again, like I think the one thing that's great about that kind of relationship with rivalry is that I, at Milrose, J- Josh spoke great in his post-race interview and I as well. And when, when Josh was, was kicking me in the bum, did the same thing. Like we definitely give respect to when it's due. And that's the great thing about our sport is I feel like everyone's just way too nice, way too nice. Mm-hmm. And at the point of <laughs> giving credit to when people do well and, and sometimes you don't do as well. And in such an individual sport, it's a very um, lovely thing to see people giving that credit and respect to another athlete when our sport is so selfish and egocentric at sometimes. And uh, that's why I enjoy the rivalry and, and picking it up. So hopefully with Oregon, um, Cooper and, and Cole, they might do a new generation video. They might come out in a couple of weeks' time giving us, I don't know, giving us some sort of slack. It'll be enjoying to watch if they do. Um, or they, you know, make fun of us for not breaking the world best that's coming up. They could do that, honestly. So uh, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, I, I'd like to push that a bit more because I think it makes people excited and also it could make people love Cooper and Cole more when I, when I say stuff like that. Or it makes us, uh, some people love OAC more. So creating a little bit of a fan um, fan rivalry was also a bit of fun. Are you concerned at all that if you guys break the world best, that it would only live for like 12 hours because the college four by mile the next day could break it? I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wisconsin just had a bunch of guys run 337s and 336s. Ole Miss, they got Mario Garcia Romo and a bunch of – 338 yeah. guys, Texas, sub four milers, Georgetown, Villanova. No, I, I think it'd be a, a slow, um, slow defeat looking at them breaking. <laughs> I think they are very, very capable, if not more capable than us. I mean, uh, Old Miss, I think is probably the most threatening. Uh, they have a fantastic group of lads that could run really fast when they're on. Um, Wisconsin looks fantastic. Obviously, I'm going to give them a lot of credit. Um, Owen Hacker in his 20th year of college um, is is doing incredible <laughs> things. Um, but he he's in unbelievable shape. You know, 13, 19, it looked like he had more in the bank, so he could probably run a really fast mile. Adam Spencer, another Aussie. Uh, Jackson Sharp, another Aussie, running amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, a college college team could take it down. And the way I think you guys have covered it so well, like the way which college uh, com- competition and racing has gone from just one extreme to another. Um, it makes me very, very glad that I, I left college um, because they're just running <laughs> incredible times and doing incredible things. And it kind of scares me that I would probably be absolutely swept under the rug uh, when I was in college. But I, I think that's a very big possibility, a very big chance. I think it's going to be cool to see if that happens because there's been so much spotlight on um, Oregon breaking it or us breaking it. And then if some other, you know, if Old Miss just comes and just destroys it, it'd be very, very cool and a great recruiting tool for that for that college to uh, come out and, and do a world's best. So it's definitely very possible. And I think if we if we do, uh, fortunately, uh, break it and get a world's best, we'll probably celebrate it as much as possible because we know it's not going to last long. <laughs> I, one, uh, one other, so you haven't run yet this this outdoor season, correct? You haven't, have you? No, sorry, no, I have not. It's pouring rain now in Texas. So sorry if you hear uh, <laughs> lightning in the back. Well, it's good. thunder. Um, you're opening up your season with this this mile. Uh, what's kind of your game plan preparing yourself for Worlds? Because it's kind of crazy. We look at the clock and it's already almost here. Like July is going to be here before we know mm. it. Uh, what's your racing plan that you have kind of going into the month of May and June? Yeah, so for me, obviously, Penn's an important thing for our brand, and we're going to try and portray and be on our best behavior um, going into that and <laughs> doing something crazy. Our coffee club will be there doing a, doing a podcast as well. Um, but, yeah, we're going to go with that. We'll do a 5K. Um, I think we're going to do a 5K paced after the 4 by mile. It's so similar to what the Oregon guys did, just a bit of just like a bit of a training workout session. Um, I'll head to um, the sound running the next week and do some pacing and then also i think my first like official race 1500 race will be birmingham um 
with my with my best friend Josh Kerr um, and some other great athletes coming in like George as well. So um, that that would be the plan moving forward. And I think for me and, and for every athlete going through now, particularly ones that have probably already kind of cemented themselves um, in their teams to, to go and compete in Eugene is to, to win races. Um, the one thing I, I kind of watched from a distance uh, from Jakob last year was when he, his first interview, when I got second to him in Gateshead, he said, like, at times that are relevant, I just want to win races. I want to beat the best guys, win races, know how they race. And I think that's one thing that I'm going to try and take into leading really into this um, championship year is just to try and win races, try and beat some of the best guys in the world. Because if you can do that and you can kind of watch their strategies and, and challenge them, it gives you a better insight into leading into championship racing. So um, that's going to be my strategy going forward, um, competing in those world uh, well, world championships and obviously come games 10 days later, which will be interesting to see that double up with a lot of athletes. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of my plan going forward. Uh, I'll be fortunate enough to run Birmingham and then I'll run um, pre down the mile. So hopefully I see some, uh, some Cooper, uh, Cooper and Cole action, be able to rub, rub elbows with the uh, Oregon greats. Um, and then I'll go to, uh, I'll go to Oslo. Uh, and do the Dream Mile with Jakob, which will be a, a great experience as well, and then get ready for Eugene. So the nice thing about Eugene as well, for a lot of athletes that are based in the US, is that it's not much of a travel for us to our flight. So it's going to be better than Tokyo. Um, we're going to be nice and close and getting into training in Boulder and getting excited about it. But um, yeah, I think the one thing I'm taking away from this season in particular is to try and win races and try and beat some some big heavy hitters, as Morgan would say. Is there any like strategy that you're gonna like data that you're gonna gather in these upcoming diamond league races like the 15 the birmingham the mile at pre racing up against a Jakob, like the people you're gonna see in that final in eugene is there anything that you you kind of focus on in those races outside of just trying to win them for like data purposes yeah. you're like all right like setting you know you're gonna be going up against these four guys and these three guys you know in two months time yeah, definitely. I think the way is, is always going to be um, the finish, I think, uh, of, of lower races. Who, who's finishing the best? Maybe they're not winning races, but they're closing in a 52 off a really fast pace or stuff like that. Like, I think that's stuff they'll be aware of, um, as well as like the different ways people can race. Because I've noticed now in particular, it's getting interesting, the 1500, because last year it was all about running really, really quick from the gun and just, just holding people out. Whereas I think this year, there's going to be a lot more of like a Josh Kerr kind of style race where you push from the hardest point and mm. you keep going um, from 800 out from 600 out. Uh, I can, I can see a lot of those races going down like that because a lot of those athletes, uh, 329, 330 guys, they don't need to run a fast time. They just want to win the race and, and break people. So be interesting to see how the, all those races play out. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Chariot runs because a lot of the way he races is he goes hard from the start. Maybe he goes through a 151, 152, first 800, then he'll slow down to a 60, and then he'll close in a 53. So races like that will be interesting to see if he actually does things like that that are ridiculous, um, or he, he kind of races a bit more conservatively because of what happened to him at the Olympics with Jakob kind of playing his card and, and letting him go take the lead and, and Jakob sitting up on him. But um, it'll be interesting to see what people are going to use uh, tactic-wise, but I'm probably going to be yeah, paying attention data-wise to – the way they finish, how far they finish out, how far they kick from, whether they win or lose that race. It'll be interesting to see where they are because in a lot of championship races, if if a race goes slow from the start and then picks up, a lot of those athletes will be able to just close down and, and get the get the spot. And that's the one thing you want to do is get the get through as easy as possible through the rounds. Um, and a lot of those athletes will be able to be able to judge in a lot of those diamond leagues from where they are, not just fitness wise, but tactic wise in, in closing and finishing races. You said before you think we're going to see more aggressive racing this year. Obviously, you race like that. Josh races like that. I'm thinking back last year, I think it was at Mount Sac. It was you and Justin Knight that broke away from mm. everybody else. Josh hasn't been shy about basically calling out the American runners. Gordon hasn't been shy about calling out the American runners, although his PR is much slower than Josh Kerr, so the credibility is lacking there. <laughs> but it's all out there. It's all out there at this point. Everybody knows like how how you guys feel. Do you think that is enough to encourage a collective mindset shift? Or do you think the people who are going to be the kick, think they're the kickers are still going to kick and the people like you and Josh are going to be tasked with getting this thing going 
you know, lap two, lap three, and carrying it through to the exciting finish. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, I mean, Josh and I joked about it at Milrose. It's like, oh, Scotsman and an Aussie in one of the biggest American <laughs> indoor meets in the world. Uh, you know, Col- Colby, actually, to his credit, went with it. Um, and he's he's a, he's a fantastic mm-hmm. runner to watch. He's exciting. Um, but there is that kind of shift because I think if you give the reins to me and Josh or individuals like us who race like that, you're kind of setting in for defeat because you go, oh, no, here they go. They're going to go for it. Mm-hmm. If you have that mindset in the race, it's over. Um, I don't think a lot of Americans are going to be happy with what what that that entails. But, yeah, I think Josh has a point. Like, I think a lot of Americans don't go for it. Um, and I agree with that. I think there's so much American talent and there's so many Americans running right now who could definitely go for it and challenge um, the lead and challenge a lot of people that run like that. I think Cooper and Cole are, are those type of people, actually those type of athletes. I mean, Cooper's uh, 353 anchor by himself shows to me that he can push it at a hard point and he could go for it and say, I'm taking the reins. I'm going to take this race. He definitely shows that. Will he do it? Well, that's just up to Cooper and obviously the race and what the Americans want to do. But um, yeah, I hope collectively it does change a mind shift. I think, I mean, looking at a lot of the best runners in the world in the 1500, a lot of them are 15, five guys now Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the guys that you see running 1500s, are running probably low 13s in the in the 5k so their strength is unbelievable so they want to play with that with their advantage and i think the one thing that particularly in male um middle distance running is everyone thinks they have the best kick everyone thinks they can close yeah. in a 51 50 if it's a really slow race and if you watch the british uh trials for the olympics uh whiteman and kerr did exactly that they closed like absolute steam trains so like kerr, if kerr can close like that and can run maybe one, you know, 148 or, or whatever, like 800 out in a, in a 1500 meter race, then really like he has a lot more tools than a lot of those guys who just think they can run off a slow race. So I think you'll see a difference in that. I think um, Cole in particular, um, from what he showed at the Olympics, he's very, he's matured a lot, I think, from those racing anyway. So he ran a 335 off a 148, 147 close, I think, at the trial. So he's a guy that can do that too. Um, yeah, and I think Americans will definitely start to to transition to that as well. But I think the cult, I think the NCAA system has a bit to blame with that because I mean a lot of the races I did, mm-hmm. I mean I I won a race off literally a kick at the end, um, which was a big race for my career in NCAA's. But that's like what most college athletes did. Whereas now I think you can see the shift. A lot of college guys like Kip saying are just like, oh, I'm just going to go around three thirty three now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they they they're going for it. So I think that could be a transition and a shift going into it because a lot of more 1500 meter middle distance runners have a lot more tools in their arsenal to deal with different types of races, uh, depending on who's in it or who's going to like take control of it. So it will be exciting. I think a lot of Americans are going to take to Josh Kerr's call and say, all right, you've, you've said that, let's see what we can do here. Yeah. And I see, able- sorry, sorry. One, one, one more here, Gordon. Um, I see a bit of an alignment to like, don't mean to psychoanalyze here, but you guys race like you have nothing to lose. You race like you're not worried if you get eighth because you could also get first. And the way you speak about the sport, the way you talk about the sport, you carry that same sort of energy to it where it's like, hey, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to call things like I see. It might come back around and get me, but I'm also not going to bite my tongue about it. Like it kind of, it seems like you're running and your personality are, are sort of, enmeshed into one do you see it that way or am i reading too much into that no no definitely i think um the one thing that i'm very very i think i had a realization particularly going through COVID and signing with professional team being able to run professionally as an athlete it was probably a big lifetime goal of mine um but it's just this the careers that we have as professional runners are so short and i would hate to have any regret and hate to be silent and hate to like just kind of toe the line and follow every other angle. And I know a lot of athletes, not just me, feel like that, that we have an enormous amount of privilege to be able to do what we do. And the one thing that I would love to do is give back to the sport in a way in which, you know, I'd, I hope is in medals, but also could be in a way in which people view the sport. Um, I think a lot of athletes, not just me, have a lot to say and, and have a lot to give and personality wise should come through because um, there's a lot of people that I'm big fans of in in the sport that show that. Um, and a lot of it is actually just for me. Yeah, I just want to enjoy it and have fun because 
I'm going to be old and wrinkly at some point and no one's going to care about me <laughs> and all about my running achievements. And I'd love to be able to like kind of enjoy it and go through it as much as possible, enjoy being a part of it. Um, and yeah, I, I just like to say what I see. And yeah, I, the nice thing about it is I get corrected, I get educated. And that's the one thing that I, I love about it too is when I'm wrong, um, I learn something about it, which is right. And that, yeah, that's kind of my mindset. And I think you're right. My personality, my racing kind of mesh together. Um, Dathan likes to call me an emotional runner because I run on emotion. <laughs> um, but it's more of just like enjoying being passionate about it and knowing that like every, every race you do, it could be your last. You never know when an injury could pop up or when your career could kind of take a different shift. Um, but yeah, I just want to enjoy it while it's here. And, and that's kind of my mindset from it from now on. Final two questions for you, Ali. Thanks again for coming on the pod. Best of luck at Penn Relays. Question number one, will you go undefeated against Americans in 2022? Well, well uh, yes. I so far to. you are. Yes, you I haven't want lost to. an American yet. So far I am. Yes, so far I am. I would love to. Um, it's go That's going to be a challenge, but I would love to. I think the one thing as well, particularly with Haywood being the place it was for my career, um, the realization of my career as a runner. Um, I said this in Australian media. I was like, uh, well, I'd love to go and beat Americans in their home soil, even though I live in America and I'm considered an American by some Aussies. I'd love to do that. So, yeah, I'd love to keep that streak um, and no American beating me. It'd be lovely. <laughs> and then uh, last one, more of an immediate prediction. What are you guys going to run on Friday? What's the time? What are you guys get? What are you going to run? Predict. Uh, so it's uh, – uh, the time is going to be, so it's, what's well, it? 15.49 is the record? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, 15.45 sounds pretty nice. All right. You know, it's got, wow. it's got a four, got, got two fives in it and a one. I like those numbers. Um, I'd like to run that. Um, yeah, uh, I think, I think we could see a time around that. Sounds good. We'll hold you to it. 15.45. With uh, how fast of a close? What's the anchor leg running? What's the depends on and depends on how much my yeah it, it depends on how much my teammates hate me that day. Maybe I uh, stir them up too much and they think you know what? Oh, you can take the reins here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd love to. I mean, I'd love to run. If you know, seeing obviously Cooper do something incredible like fifty three, I'd like to put myself in that same avenue of running, maybe quicker than that. But again, it depends on weather. Depends on where we are. But either way, I'm going to give it a crack and. Hopefully make it exciting. We'll just say this. If you run sub 353 on your anchor, that counts as continuing your streak of beating Americans. You just have to run faster okay. than 353. Okay. <laughs> 352 or better. Okay. Yeah. No, I just I walked into that one, didn't I? Yeah. No. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> provided, provided it needs to happen. If you're obviously not into it, yeah. you're not going to, you know, but if you're in it, go for yeah. 352. If I run 354, then that's a loss. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ali, thanks so much. Best of luck at Penn. We'll see you there. Uh, it's going to be fun. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Appreciate, for, uh, appreciate you guys having me. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ali. That All was right. Oliver Hoare. Great, great interview. Great pod. Kevin, you have anything else you want to add? Well, he also said he's going to be podcasting when he's there. So it's good to know that somebody else is going to be checking a microphone in their luggage. Um, I'm a little nervous to compete against him as a podcaster. I'm not going to lie. He has a little more credibility. Uh, more people know his name. So I thought we had the market cornered on Penn Relay specific podcasts. So we might need to, uh, I don't know, we might need to up our game. We might need to figure out a way where we can upend the coffee club. But, but in all seriousness, people, if, if you're into distance running, Listen to that pot. I mean, it's kind of amazing in 2022, the amount of information and insight you can get into professional athletes' lives. Like these guys are recording, you know, hour, hour and a half every week and just telling you exactly how they feel. And if you're a fan of other sports, this is nothing new. Like a lot of athletes have their own podcast, but they don't hold back. It's not just a bunch of cliches and platitudes. So I've, I've enjoyed the pot even before they talked about the, the four by mile thing. So people should check it out. But um, we're going to have, what's the schedule for this week? We're, we're pre-recording a pod for Wednesday tomorrow, right? About Penn. Yeah. Cause assuming the thunder and lightning does not destroy. I don't know if people can hear this. It is insane. The, how loud this is. I'm glad I'm in a soundproof booth. 
Yeah, we're going to record our big pen relays preview pod tomorrow, post it on Wednesday because we're flying out on Wednesday. And then yeah. we'll do a live pod same time on Friday from Philadelphia. In the, We'll find somewhere in the stadium to do our podcast at normal time at 9 a.m. Recap Thursday's events, preview Friday's events, especially the four by mile. And then we'll also do another pod Saturday morning. Are we provided high? our we haven't asked our producer yet if he can make it, but we're gonna do one Saturday morning as well. Um, if, if we don't, it's because we weren't able to figure out our schedules. But we'll Blame probably Colt. do Blame Colt. Yeah, so we'll do a pod today, obviously. We're doing a pod Wednesday and then Friday and Saturday. And again, watch all of Pen Relays live on Flow Track. It's gonna be awesome. Also, Peyton Jordan. We haven't even talked about that. That's going down live on Friday night. So that's gonna yeah. be fun. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, the big meet, the Cal versus Stanford dual meet, it's gonna be live on Flow mm-hmm. Track. It's gonna be great. Lots of good mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, it's gonna be a very busy weekend uh, of track and field. I got to get to it, so we'll leave it there. Uh, thanks everybody. Subscribe if you haven't yet to the Flow Track Podcast YouTube page. Uh, thank you to Travis. Thank you to Colt. Thank you to our guest, Oliver Hort. That went really well. We need to have more guests on. If you have guest you recommendations, do. send us an email, leave it in the chat. We'll talk to you guys next time.